Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. Tomorrow, tomorrow. That's what we all say, right? It's easy to hit snooze or push off what doesn't seem urgent to another day. But building generational wealth? That can't wait. Find out more at massmutual.com slash financial legacies. Hello, this is Anita and this is Black Menopause and Beyond. I have an absolutely fabulous guest today, Veronica, and she is going to talk about her journey with fibroids and how her journey in fibroids connected to her menopause journey. Um, so, Veronica, if you can tell my listeners a bit about who you are, okay. uh, we'll get the interview started. Right. Hello, everyone. So I'm Veronica Ebanks, um, born in Jamaica, raised in the UK. I came to the UK in 1963, so I've been through the school system. I'm in my early 60s and I have four children and plenty or lots of grandchildren. Um, I'm a biological science graduate. I did biological sciences with biotech at in Luton and went on to work in the science sector and the teaching sector. I got into teaching that way and did a teaching qualification that entitled me or qualified me to teach adults 16 plus teaching further education. So I've delivered sessions on science, literacy and numeracy, and across several science, um, science modules across several different courses way back in time. Left teaching to support students because I realized that underpinning issues and underlying problems prevented students from learning. And I moved into support to support students and became a safeguarding advisor and personal guidance advisor first, then safeguarding advisor. I took redundancy in 2014 and created a freelance business for myself, whereby I go into organizations and deliver safeguarding trainer safeguarding training and train trainer training around safeguarding. After being a practitioner for how many decades, I thought if I'm taking redundancy and working for myself, I'm going to use the skills and the knowledge and expertise that I've gleaned and gained and um, perfected over many years of work and to create a business for myself and become a freelancer. Um, there's lots more I could say, but I know time is of the essence. <laughs> you're, you're a woman that has many talents and skills and knowledge, I can tell. <laughs> and um, today we're going to talk about fibroids. Can you tell us a bit about what fibroids are or about your fibroids? So for those individuals listening who may not know what a fibroid is or just hearing that term for the first time, fibroids are non-cancerous or benign growths that grow in the uterine or the womb muscle. All right. So they grow inside the womb and sometimes they can grow outside of, they can grow to such an extent that they grow out of the womb and actually can be growing into the, into the abdominal cavity. Um, Black women are four times more likely to develop fibroids over their life course. It's one of those, it's one of those conditions whereby you don't know you've got fibroids until you start having symptoms or you get pregnant and then you go for your scan. And sometimes for some women, this is the first time they hear that they actually have these benign growths, these non-cancerous growths growing in their wombs or in their uterus. All right. Right. So in my case, I'd had my children. I was in my, uh, I'd gone through my early forties, mid forties. I think I'd gone into perimenopause, but my stomach had started to expand. My stomach, my abdomen started to get bigger and bigger and just kept, it felt hot. And my two feet were swollen as if someone had poured water into my two feet. And especially when the weather was warm, my toes began to look like sausages and my bleeding, my monthly cycle was 
it, it was described as heavy, meaning that I could soak through my clothes, soak through a pad, soak through a Tampax and a pad within an hour. Um, and that was a consequence of having these growths that I did not know about. I just assumed an enlarged abdomen, swollen feet, feeling unwell, wanting to pee every five minutes or every, you know, every half an hour, even though you just left the house, you just gone to the loo before you, you left the house. By the time you got to your journey, maybe half an hour's journey, an hour's journey, you needed to go again because of the pressure of the my, my uterus pressing down on my bladder. And one day at work, I got up from my seat and it, it was a mess. <laughs> and I felt, you know, the blood, the menstrual blood coming down my, my legs. And it was at that stage I, de- I decided this cannot be normal. There must be something wrong. This can't be it. How, how, how can women be in work and this kind of stuff was happening? How th- I, I'm going to speak to someone. And this is the first time I decided to go and see a doctor. And I rang and made an appointment and went to my GP. Now, what I did during that period of time, because then that GP visit started a whole chain of doctor visits, hospital visits, and interventions and what culmin and those all culminated in a hysterectomy because it was found when they did all their exploration and I'd had different um, interventions. But the long story short, they decided a hysterectomy was the best way forward. Well, they gave me two options. They gave me the hysterectomy as one and something called uterine embolization, uterine artery embolization, UAE. Yeah. For, as an acronym, as an abbreviation, whereby they, let me just say what hysterectomy is first, and then I'll tell you what the other thing was. So I had two options. So the hysterectomy is where the uterus and sometimes the ovaries, sometimes the fallopian tubes and the cervix is removed from the body. Anything that ends in tomy means removal, right? Like a appendectomy and so on and so on. So That was an option. And the second option they gave me was to have something called uterine artery embolization, whereby the medics, this is done in the hospital under general anesthetic, will through your go into enter your groin, make an incision in your groin and insert instruments. And I suppose for want of a better word, to keep it simple and succinct, a tube up into major blood vessel and inject a substance to starve the fibroids of blood. Because if the fibroids are starved of blood, it means they're starved of hormones, they're starved of nutrient, and they can't grow, and they'll start to um, atrophy or they'll start to die yeah, or shrink. So those are the two choices I had. They said to me that they would, once I was on the table, on the operating table, they would, if I chose the, the hysterectomy um, option, they would decide which way they were going to do it because there are several ways you can have a hysterectomy done. Okay, so one of the ways is through your vagina. The instruments are inserted up into the vagina through the cervix and they use the instruments to remove the fibroids that way, right? Or remove the whole womb, sorry, that way with the fibroids that are in there as well. So everything comes out. They can take out the the fallopian tubes as well at the same time, and they can take out the ovaries. So I suppose they snip, snip, once the instruments are in there, everything's snipped up. I'm just being very, using very simple language. Everything's snipped up and then just sucked out through the vagina. Apparently healing time and recovery time is quicker with that method, but then with everything, there are complications. Now these surgeries are major surgeries. These are not just simple surgeries. The implications and things that could go wrong are huge because when you, before you have medical procedure and operational surgery, you have to sign documents saying that you are aware, (laughs) you know, you are aware that you could what bleed, you could, you know, there could be a a mishap somewhere along the line and during the surgery and something could tear or something could be cut or something. So you sign all these documents. So you're fully aware when you're going in that there is a potential, albeit a small one for, I suppose, secondary injury or harm to yourself. But you're signing up because you believe that this surgery is the surgery that's going to give you a better quality of life. Because at the end of the day, and to remove pain, because if you're in pain and if you're heavy bleeding and if your your stomach, your feet are swollen and you're becoming anemic and so on, it damages your quality of life. So that's one way they can do it. 
They can also do it through something called a laparoscope, which is, you might've heard the term keyhole surgery, right? They make two small cuts or one small cut near the belly button and one slightly below. And the instruments go in a light and a probe and other instruments that they can use through the two small incisions or through the two small cuts. And they can do the hysterectomy that way. And then there's the abdominal, the full abdominal way where they literally make a horizontal cut the second way is through a laparoscope or an instrument called a laparoscope. You might may have heard the term keyhole surgery, where the surgeon makes a small cut, maybe near the um, near the belly button and maybe one further down, and the instruments go in through the two small incisions. All right, and they can do the hysterectomy that way. And then finally, they can perform the hysterectomy through your abdomen in terms of a a long vertical cut or a long horizontal cut on the abdomen area. And it depends on the size of your uterus. And that determines what kind of cut you get and also what kind of hysterectomy you'll have, because it depends on when they open you up or have a look through various um, interventions and other te- and other methods like hysteroscopy. Now, I kept a journal while I, while I was going through all these interventions and I called it the hysterectomy chronicle. I had my hysterectomy over 10 years ago and I wrote everything down because that was how I I've always written things and I felt that I needed to document it for my own well-being, just so that I could make sense. And when they explained something to me and when I jotted it down and went home and somewhere sometime in the night, I would write out what I'd gone through that day, what what procedure I'd had and so what questions questions I'd asked. Um, My uterus was a 15 week size. Um, Now, normally your your uterus is about the size of a fist, they say. Um, if you can imagine maybe a, a large-ish avocado, maybe. Okay. Right. Now, I documented everything. As I said, I found my journal last year. I was going through some boxes. And remember, this is over 10 years ago. And I found my written journal, my handwritten journal. And I looked at it and I thought, well, would this be of any use to any women? And then I thought about it. A voice said, you can't publish that. That's too personal. And then another voice said, but... How do we know if you don't publish it? How will we know what our experiences are? And a voice said, well, publish it. No one can beat you now. (laughs) Publish it. So I did. I self-published it. As a consequence of that, I've had people approach me. People are are saying, yeah, you're right. We don't talk about hysterectomy. We don't talk about fibroids. Menopause, right, which you're one of the experts of, one of the, you know, you have have the expertise and knowledge around menopause. I wouldn't say I'm an expert. It's just something I like to talk about. <laughs> right. Well, I, well, well, individuals will view yeah. you as an expert because okay. you have, you know, you have spoken about it publicly mm-hmm. and on certain platforms. So we view you as a menopause expert, whether you want to accept that or not. <laughs> You're it. I'm an activist. <laughs> You're an activist. I'm, right. I'm an activist. Yeah. End of the end of the day, uh, a menopause expert. I generally see someone with a medical degree, and um, right. because I don't have a medical degree, I wouldn't call myself an expert. However, right. I'm passionate about mm-hmm. dialogue about the topic, and that that I'm an activist. Yeah, yeah. But unlike menopause, the comparison I'm trying to make is we very very rarely hear people talk about fibroids, but we all know somebody who's got it or had them or. As a consequence of having them, they've had to undergo hysterectomy or surgery, myomectomy. It's another term where they actually go in and try and excise or cut out and reduce the fibroids without going through the, well, there are different ways of doing them doing it again, the myomectomies. It's one of those things that we don't talk about. It's still considered taboo. We may whisper it amongst ourselves and our friends. Oh, yeah, someone's had a hysterectomy. It's still a taboo. In fact, periods and heavy bleeding and maybe for some cultures, but the majority of people that I've met, it's the same in their culture as well. Periods and bleeding and it's something secretive that the woman must keep secret. Yes, there are cultures where becoming coming of age and starting you know starting um menstruation is a is a thing and it's celebrated and so on from where i'm coming from it's it's almost i saw a change in my guardian the day i told her that i'd seen something and i wasn't sure what it was and then she explained when i say explained the explanation i got was now i had to stay away from boys and i was given a packet (laughs) of dr white's 
<laughs> oh yeah, we've got one. Yeah, right. And a belt. Yeah, a little belt, a little elasticated belt with two little things that you. <laughs> anyway, and that was my that was my menstruation talk. Yeah, Stay away cool. from boys. Do not bring in any belly. That was the talk, <laughs> right? And that was it. End of. Stay away from boys. Don't bring in any belly. But there wasn't any other conversation around it other than yes when 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 this thing is dirty go and change it mm. that was it mm. right I would have loved to have asked more questions so where did I go I went to my school friends because some of them had already started um their this journey of menstruation so I could go and ask some of them and and, and obviously you're not getting <laughs> you're not getting accurate facts no you don't when you're, you not, when you're 11 and 12 mm. you're not getting accuracy are you so my journey from starting menstruation, I document to all the way through my having my, I had my children and I then developed the fibroids over time. Now, can I just drop something in? Yeah. It was after I had my children that I started to use chemical relaxers. Okay. Well, did you think they connected? Or? I don't know. This is, this, this is why I'm following some of the, res- the, the research around um, carcinogens and some of the um, endocrine disruptors that are in some of our products, our hair products, et cetera, mainly. And I know that there are now live cases where certain brands are now being sued by black women in America. I don't know of any cases here in the UK, but I know there's at least two. I think, is it L'Oreal? I think it's L'Oreal that have been, um, what's the word? They've been um, highlighted as having substances in their products whereby at least one woman has had a hysterectomy and I think another woman has developed some kind of condition. I'm, look, I'm looking at that because, you know, when you start thinking, well, where did, where did the fibroids come from? When did they start? Because mm-hmm. it was silent. It wasn't until I started to, but I just thought that was normal. I look at some of my seniors, her, yeah, but her, her stomach, got, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, a member of a church and I'd look around and I'd see the mothers, as we'd call them. And most of their tummies were kind of large. And I thought, oh, so maybe this is, this is, this is something just what happens to you as you get, oh, as you kind of mature, your stomach sticks out. I mean, I, I can relate to what you said about um, the lack of, I suppose the lack of education around fibroids. I've apparently had a fibroid. And um, when I had a cesarean for my second son, mm-hmm. that's when it was found and that's when it was taken out. Well, apparently, how did it get out? Apparently. Right. Um, and the reason why I say apparently is because as part of my checkups after the cesarean, mm-hmm. I went to my GP, they were looking at my health records and said, oh, you've had a fibroid taken out. Oh, and that's awesome. the only thing I was ever told. That was it. Wow. What is that? And they didn't even tell you. They didn't even have the, didn't even see you as an individual needing that kind of common courtesy, as I would call it, to actually say, you know, this is what we found and we've removed this and it's all nicely in your notes, but they've actually had a conversation with you. So Yeah. So afterwards it was just, the GP just happened to, the the GP or nurse, I can't remember who was looking at my birth records with regard to my son. Um, And that's when it was mentioned. And then, and then I asked, what's that? And then, they said, oh, it's just, it's nothing to worry about, but it was taken out during, you know, when you had just son. And then yeah. that was literally it took two minutes. And that was it. Conversation. And then afterwards, I went back and I asked the doctor a bit more and I said, could you, because I still had heavy periods. And I said yeah. to the doctor, could you check? And, and then um, I went to have some checks done. They said they couldn't find any fibroids right. at all. But that's it. I don't really know. And I do know a friend of mine who recently... Mm-hmm. She she was heavy periods. Yeah, um, she was just so tired. She was considering going part time from her job, but she couldn't afford to go part time because right. she was tired and her periods were affecting her. Right. And then they went and took out her fibroids. Right, um, and she she's fine. She's normal. She could. She was just happy. She had energy. Right, and I know someone who collapsed because their fibroid became so big it disrupted her or something, and she had to yeah. be rushed to the hospital. Yeah. But even then, I know nothing about fibroids. <laughs> Right, right. I, see, again, it's education. The fact that we now know that it affects people that look like you and me four times as much than, you know, the, the incidence is four times greater for people that look like us. And it happens to, it can happen to anyone, ethnicity, but normally or usually 
women above the age of 30 and above the age of 40. Between so those kind what? of ages, between those ages, it's quite common to develop fibroids in later, in, in that kind of stage, 35, 55, 60, that kind of, it, it, it's that. And the majority of women who have hysterectomies are in their 40s and early 50s, the majority. And do you know, do you, do you happen to know why it affects black women more? Or is it one of those things yet nobody right. knows? Interesting. Right. I'm glad you asked that because some of the reading reading around that I've been doing, some of the research I've been doing, there are certain implications. So ten, some of them are tentative, but some of them are looking strong, i.e. estrogen levels. They've done studies where they've compared in terms of ethnicities. So African diaspora women compared to Asiatic women compared to Caucasian women, if that's the correct term. And when they looked at the, the levels, we had twice as much estrogen, almost twice as much estrogen in our systems than the Asian, sorry, than the Caucasian lady. And one and, a, and almost one and a half times more than the Asian. So in terms of a gradient, we have the highest levels of estrogen, followed by the Asiatic, followed by the Caucasian lady. Does that make sense? Was so, with this? Was it, um... Just a paper. I go on PubMed. I go on to PubMed and I go on to... It's very important yeah. menopause. So it's just I didn't know yeah. there was a difference. Yeah. So and I've only found that out this year. That, that This is a paper that I read this year. Um, and I've gone to the NHS website and it mentions it on there. They're looking at, I think these studies are, are mainly American studies have put, highlighted obesity as a potential for um, the propensity or the, you know, the prevalence of fibroids in black women, obesity. So we've got estrogen, we've got obesity. Another paper that I've read, and I, I'm kind of leaning towards this one. Um, I'll leave the hair one for now and come back and come back to it is the vitamin D. They're now saying tentatively that there may be a link between vitamin D and black women and fibroids. So mm -hmm. again, this is fairly new research which I saw last year. That's something to, I suppose, bear in mind. And if we are in, if we are taking supplements and considering supplements, um, obviously speak to your GP um, and consider taking a D a D three. Um, supplement you know they say we don't make enough take, vitamin D. yeah and take a high dosage as well don't yeah. don't follow yeah. the guidelines the guidelines on they, they weren't made for us <laughs> they weren't made, made for caucasian skin and, and clearly right. exactly exactly, exactly. Yeah. and also and for a larger person you need more vitamin d i discovered as well darkness means more vitamin d so don't follow the guidelines yeah. talk to a nutritionist or somebody in a health shop or yeah, even chemists, because chemists actually know. Yeah, uh, they, do. they they know the good because yeah, because they know a good uh, recommendation depending on your skin and age and size. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. I I, I take vitamin D. I take vitamin D, but it has to be taken in in concert with some other stuff as well to make it to make it efficient. But anyway, and and then it brings the argument about the sunscreen. Do black people need to wear sunscreen? They do. Sunscreen. So that brings another. Um, element to it because there's, it's it's split. Some say no because we don't make enough vitamin D. We need, but the UV rays, right, or the the, the UVB, UVA, UVB, um, it can still damage your skin because my one of my sons did burn and peel. Mum went to Florida one year. He was in the pool every day, just you know, with his little swimming trunks, and he, he was out there practically all day and every day and swimming and stuff. And he burnt both his shoulders. Mm. He burnt. That's another. That's another side. Talking about skin cancer, I've recently had to have a biopsy, right? Because they thought I had skin cancer. So I've had to read. I, I didn't have skin cancer, thank right. goodness, right. Um, right? But I've read so much stuff about black skin yeah. and skin cancer. That you know, undiagnosed, we have a hot, we have a higher rate, even though it's very unlikely we are protected, but we're not 100% protected from skin cancer. Yeah. Um, and then when we do get it, because we just don't think it's skin cancer because we haven't got blue eyes and blonde hair, yeah, all, all the articles on, on the internet, if you don't mention black yeah. and you mention skin cancer, there's a presumption they've got fair skin, blue eyes, or green yeah. eyes, and blonde hair. Yeah. And we're more likely to die from skin cancer. Yeah. Exactly. I've read that too. In terms of research, then we come to the chemicals in hair and um, I suppose scalp, which is us, which is our skin mm. products. So it's been highlighted on national news, national TV, 
that the manufacturers of said products are now encouraged to limit these chemicals in the products, these um, endocrine disruptor type additives and synthetics in the products. BBC ran an article, I think I posted it on my on my Instagram page about two years ago, year, I think either before lockdown or just in lockdown, there was, it was on BBC Evening News. It was an article about black women's products, hair products. The reason I brought that topic up earlier, I'd had my children and then I started to perm my hair, to use chemical treatments to straighten my hair. So my question, I suppose, to myself is, is that a causal factor? Is that something that tipped my chances of developing fibroids into a greater probability? It's just something I ask myself from time to time. I'm not obese, but I never took vitamin D as supplements when I was pregnant. I think they gave us vitamin B when you're pregnant and you get is it folate and whatever else you get, but you don't get um, vitamin D. Hair products, vit- lack of vitamin D. I've never been obese. So I, I'm left. Well, well, why? I'm and that's, that's why. Also, when we're in a situation where the chemicals in some of our hair stuff are extremely strong, yeah. And because it's black hair stuff, no one's really going to ever explore it fully, are they? No. That, no. You know, if it, if it was something that um, appeared in Caucasian hair stuff, it would be explored a lot, right. further, and you would have answers right. because it's black hair stuff. But where do you think a lot of it's made? A lot of the stuff that we've been buying for our hair, where do you think it's manufactured? Um, I haven't got a clue. Is it is it Oriental? In the East. I, I think a lot of it's made in the East. So therefore, they don't even have black black people to have discussions on with regards to the head. Um, the science isn't there, but the science isn't there because what we're finding out now, and there's a lovely doctor that posts lots of Instagram um, information about black. He's, I think, he's a surgeon, he's a medic, and he posts lots of um, polls about healthcare and black people. That's no, it shouldn't be a one size fits all. Certain calculations that were developed that said, right, black people is this and Caucasians is that. He's saying they've made so many errors and now these errors are all coming to light. We're not all the same. Oxygen meters, you know, in COVID, you know, lots of people um, went out and bought these oxygen meters you put on your finger. Well, apparently they're not calibrated to um, <laughs> to, to detect through the, the melanin in the skin, in dark skin. So the readings are not accurate. Mm-hmm. I mean, I bought one. But I, I read up and I thought, OK, but I'm still going to use it anyway, because put it this way, if oxygen levels are dropping, I, at least I'd get hopefully get something okay. along with the, the, the signs and symptoms that mm. my family member is exhibiting. That at least it will give me, you know, adequate time to maybe ring an ambulance if I had to or get that person to the hospital. You with me? I just the thought of, I'd rather have one than not have one. I mean, well, you mentioned something about there isn't the science, but I was I was. I was being interviewed for a podcast last week Hmm. and I said in this podcast and I said, people forget that there's actually more brown and black people in the world than Caucasians. They get that. But the default is always Caucasian for everything. And I understand that the Western world, Europe and America, they dominate the wealth of the world. I I can't quite remember, but I'm sure, I think it's over 70% of the wealth um, I mean, it might have changed. I don't know if Asia, China, and so for instance, have an influence. Mm, but it's, it's well over 50%, well over, mm. well, well, well over 50% of the wealth right. is is in Europe and in America. Um, and that's what influences the narrative. Um, right. So science and medicine is focused on the people who have money. Yeah. It's very much a money driven industry. Yes, it is. Uh, but it's not fair. Because there are differences and the people who suffer mm. are people like you and me, even though we, we live in Europe. Yeah. We live, we were born in Europe. You know, my children. Well, well, I, well I wasn't born in Europe, you, but, but I was raised, but I was raised here. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my children are born here, but when it comes to, um, and, and also sometimes I, I get quite frustrated because mm. I don't, the other day I've got black skin, I'm dark skin, and people kind of think, well, you know what, you're, you're a visitor. You know, if you don't like it, leave. But actually, I've done a DNA test. I've got Caucasian <laughs> ancestry, which goes back six generations. Come on. Okay. <laughs> so actually, I am part of this country. And therefore, yeah. 
because I'm part of this country, and mm. they, and I, yeah, I'm going to be a bit blunt. I was forced to be part of this country because six, yeah. five, six generations ago, my my parents, my ancestors didn't have white Caucasian because they want um, Caucasian DNA because they wanted it. It was forced. I, to be I hear you. I hear you. It was forced. And, to be and, and the history there. <laughs> history. There, there were people to... like us that were here centuries before enslavement. Yeah. Well, the lords and ladies and yeah. dignitaries were people that had highly melanated skins. <laughs> so um, I think that there should be money. Um, when they spend money on doing research, they should put more effort in being diverse because the reality is that anything that they develop will mm. become worldwide medication. Yeah. yeah. Um, even though they may generate more money from Europe and America. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean that people in Africa, I mean, Africa's it got millions, billions of people in it. So yeah. it doesn't mean people in Africa are never going to purchase it. Um, you know, and, and like black people in America and England are never going to purchase it. So therefore I feel that it should be, they should make more effort to do. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a big, the gyne issues are huge, but we in where we are, we just don't seem to have the prioritized, care around these issues we, um, just, we just don't talk about female issues full stop i mean no. the reality is in england we talk about female issues a lot more than yeah. other countries so once you had your hysterectomy to deal with yeah. your fibroids yeah that's when you went straight into postmenopause, i presume yeah i think i was already in perimenopause when i um had my operation because i was getting hot flushes and i was kind of yeah getting symptoms but my ovaries were left in place all right so my ovaries were left in place meaning that i could still produce estrogen and progesterone progesterone and and a couple of the small hormones that I, that were involved as well but over time what will happen is I've, from what i've read is that because the the uterus is almost on its own i was going into i was in perimenopause then um everything or they might start to atrophy because it's not the same. The supporting organs and have now been removed. So you've just got these two um, ovaries and they left my fallopian tubes in, or at least they left one of them in because I had an issue, which I mentioned in the book, but I'm not going to mention today. I had to go back to have another surgery. I had a massive issue and I had to go back into hospital. They sutured me up. I had a form of prolapse and I had to go back into hospital. They say that y- you're... But did you go into post or were you still in Perry? I think I was probably still in Perry at the time. I think I was still in perimenopause because after I had my operation, I was still getting night sweats and I was still sweating and I was still um, mm. joint pain. My eyesight deteriorated quite badly. Um, so, yeah. I was still in perimenopause. And I think when I got to about, I'd say maybe about five years ago, yeah. I, I probably felt, oh, actually, I'm, I'm not feeling some of those symptoms anymore. Mm-hmm. So I think I was about maybe 57 when I can say, I think I, I kind of came through the other side. But obviously, once I'd had my operation, I wasn't having any more periods anyway, because there was no uterus to bleed. So no- you had... That some stuff and then some stuff stops. That's me being scientific. That's yeah, why. I'm an yeah, yeah. Because once once the, once the uterus is gone, there's nothing to bleed from. There's no. There's no. Even though the hormones may still be rising and falling, as as if they're still in a, a menstrual cycle, there's no uterus for them to act on. So there's no bleeding, but you still get symptoms. You still feel symptomatic of menopause because I had my ovaries still left in place. Did you take HRT at all? No. Okay. No. I, I was determined that I didn't want, I just felt it was, I just felt it was, I suppose I compared my seniors. What did our seniors do? What did our, our, our aunties and our grands and did they take HRT? No. So I decided, no, I was, I was going to go to cold turkey. I said, no matter what, I'm not taking anything. Yeah, but they, they, our elders suffered. <laughs> Can I just say? I, I, I'm not going to say that. I didn't say they didn't. I didn't say they didn't. I'm not on HRT, but I, I know that our elders really did suffer. Right. Uh, you know, right. Our, I didn't say they didn't suffer, but I just, I suppose it's, uh, uh, maybe I'm old school, or maybe it's, uh, it's, maybe it's not an age thing, but I just decided I would go without. I would just see it through. And the very fact that I, I don't have a uterus anymore uh, to bleed and, and so on, I thought, well, actually, I, I don't think I need HRT. I will just focus on my diet, exercise, and so on. 
So yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of a bit maverick. So that might look like a maverick move, but that but that that was a choice I made for me. <laughs> and what it is is, um, so I'm not a medical expert, but I've spoken yeah. to a lot of medical people, and even though yeah. there are slight increases of like, breast cancer and things like that with HRT, yeah. Yeah. talking to loads of med- menopause experts. Mm-hmm. They they kind of are comfortable with it as a as a hormone treatment. Yeah. I know that especially within the black community, more so than the white com- community, we have this attitude where it's not good. Medication. Okay. Yeah. And I yeah, think but sometimes where does that stem from? Where do you think um, that stems from? But I think what was, but I think sometimes what we have to understand that there is some stigma there. Um, and it could be that there were those people out there who would never ever take HRT, but yeah. they took insulin for yeah. diabetes, which is an yeah. alien substance to our body. Yeah, you yeah. see, when and, we and, and, inject- and the children get the injections and so on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I don't see the black community be so reluctant to take insulin. Yeah, yeah. but there's that reluctancy to take HRT. And when I talk to medical people, they mm-hmm. say that in 2023, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's it, it does increase the rate of like heart issues. Because the reason why I can't take HRT is because I'm overweight and I have high blood pressure. So well, I have high blood pressure anyway. I developed high blood pressure back in 2008. Yeah. So they're telling me because I have those two things there. Yeah. That I should not take HRT. So therefore, yeah. there is an issue. Yeah, right. but yeah, clearly there's an issue, and also when right. you're overweight, your hormones are different. Apparently, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've got more, you you've got more um fat content in the body. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So, it affects, yeah. so I can't take HRT, but yeah. but so yeah, I'm not saying there's nothing. I'm not saying it's as it's as smooth sailing as taking, you know, a, a sweet, <laughs> you know, yeah. thing like that. Yeah, but I, the hear you. Time, I hear you. Attitude should be more similar to insulin. Yeah, I don't yeah. have anyone say that I'm never touching insulin. Never, never, I, ever. I, I hear, I hear that. I, I really do hear that. But for me, um, yeah. the place I was, as I said, the place I was coming from was yeah. that actually I, I tried the contraceptive pill at some point yeah. in my kind of fertile life. And it had made me ill. It bloated me and stuff. And, and and maybe subconsciously the link is taking in something and maybe and having an effect from it. So maybe that's where that stemmed from. Yeah. And also I did have a friend who developed a blood clot on the contraceptive pill and that lady did pass away. So maybe coupled together my own personal experience and maybe what I've seen in my environment, I was determined actually... I'm just going to see this thing through because some of our, you know, our parents and our seniors did. But um, I didn't say they didn't suffer. But all I know is I didn't see my grand taking anything. She ate, but her diet was different to the diet that yes. we're probably accustomed to now. So mm. I, I decided I'd revert back and try to eat more like her, mm. more like my grand, more like my my seniors. Yeah. That kind of thing. And um, are you a vegan or? No, know? I'm not a vegan. No, mm. I'm not a vegan. I know there's black people turn vegan. No. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's quite a few and vegetarian as well. And mm. pescatarian, you know, pescatarian. I mean, mm. left to my own devices, I'll say that carefully, left to my own devices, I would probably um, become a vegetarian. If left to my own devices and I would still eat eggs and I would, um, but I would probably, yeah, because I've considered it, but uh, yeah, I'm in a position where I, I have to cook me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, he's already told me adamant to leave the vegan, make the vegetarian things steer, cook the meat. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so you're gonna stay in this house, that's what you have to do. Come on. So so I cook and I eat fish, I eat meat, um, but I eat less of it. I must admit, we eat less I eat less meat, my portion size. Um, you know, I eat more yam. Eat more yams, plantains, sweet potatoes, and greens. Um, yeah, because I, I I just want to maintain that healthy a healthier. Even though the nutritional value of food has gone down, I know the nutritional value of food is not the same. Um, and hence why we we have to supplement. Mm. Not everybody, but you know, I I believe that if you need a supplement, then yeah, then then take it, especially the vitamin D. Um, and the multi, I, I do a multivitamin and mineral complex as well. Mm. And I, I also drink Moringa tea maybe three times a week. 
the raw the raw bush moringa yeah not the powdered stuff i i get the the one you can actually see the little leaves in it in the packet oh. i don't know I, the powder one might be great but i don't know how what, what else is in the powder i don't know I can't, see, I can't see it so you know um, the, one of the biggest frauds carried out is vitamins and all that stuff one of the biggest frauds in the world is, yeah. is vitamins and the, and the caking agents and all the stuff that they yeah. add to it um, yeah no one ever takes it serious but actually you can sometimes spend like 15 20 pounds yeah, yeah, they're not cheap. On, yeah, on, on vitamins. Um, and no one really knows if it works. So you think it's working and someone's just basically put powder and flour and water and, and coloured it pink. In a capsule, and yeah. And put capsule. nice nice packaging and they sell it. Yeah. Um, and loads of people, are, are, you know, religiously buy certain vitamins and yeah. think it's, it's doing them good. So... Yeah, you never know it's true. So that's why people say it's better to take it in food form. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, I heard you that. Know what yeah. So um, we're gonna we're gonna come to an end uh, of the podcast quite soon. Right. I, I could talk a bit about all the things that you do with regards to helping women talk about you know all the, you know all the stuff that you do because you're I know that you're a bit of an activist and and you do loads of stuff. So if you can tell us a bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah. I'm d- Oh, activist is, I've never been called an activist before. You are an activist. But I'm, an, but I'm definitely an advocate for getting data, us lifting the lid on taboos so that we can actually have a good look at, well, how did um, these women, how did these women over here and these women over here, how did their experience of hysterectomy and fibroids and gynae issues, how do they compare? But because we don't talk, we've kept everything so quiet. There's just not enough data. I can't pinpoint any disparities because why I don't have any info there's no anecdotal um information there's no um collation of of hysterectomy and fibroid stories in one place I know there I saw one book on um Amazon and I think it was different country from different countries like Canada Africa I think it was women from I think four different countries it was a book one book but we need to have our stories documented when we talk, we bring our stories, we share. Not everyone we want to share, that's fine. But if we've got nothing at all to compare equality of treatment, parity of care, then we're doing, we're, we're doing ourselves an injustice. We need the information. So I help women. How do I help women? Well, I'm a bit of a freelancer, so I do several things. So I help individuals who may want to write a book. I also volunteer. So I volunteer for a centre in London called Safe Haven. Safe Haven is a charity supporting women who are recovering from trauma, body dysmorphia, um, mental health issues. So I help them. I do an online session with them once a month around drama and expressions. I call it expressions. So I do that. That's half an hour, 45 minutes once a month online. What else do I do? I vol- I'm very keen on sustainability and leaving a better planet for my grandkids. So I, <laughs> I have joined um, an organisation called Centre for Sustainable Action, who work with small, medium enterprises to collaborate to assess their own carbon footprint and to take steps to, I suppose, make improvements. I write. Aren't you, I'm sorry, but aren't you also organising um, an event in Milton Keynes? Yes. On the 1st of April, I'm putting on a conference called UK Fibroids Hysterectomy and Beyond Conference. It's a half a day at the moment, and it will be an annual conference. I've spoken it into the envir- into the universe. It's going to be an annual thing. And I've, I'm bringing together some fantastic speakers yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's open to anybody. It's not just for black. And it's an annual thing, isn't it? Just in case annual listens to the podcast yeah. after the first of April two thousand twenty three. The next one will be in two thousand twenty four around the same time. Yeah. Something. Yeah. So how does somebody get in contact with you if they want to find out a bit more about you and what you right. do and just follow your journey? Right. I have a link tree which I find is easier than just pinging out separate um, social handles and so on. I have a link tree, which is Varelba underscore world okay. 2021. Okay. And I will include that in the show, in the show notes for this podcast. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, 
Monica, you have wow. been an absolute star. Wow. Um, and I, in case anyone wonders why my voice is so husky, I have the cold. Yeah. <laughs> I have a cold. Yes. So, so it's made my voice even deeper than, than what it normally is. So I sound a bit a bit like Barry Wright. And I've got very deep <laughs> in my voice anyway. Oh, no, not as deep as Barry. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm so close to a female equivalent. If oh, I could geez. sing, I would make money. That's how deep my voice oh, is. Oh, <laughs> but, um, it's been fantastic you. talking to you. Thank you for having me. It's been fantastic talking to you. And I've learned so much. And, uh, and I think it's quite sad, really. I've learned so much about something that I apparently once had. I know nothing about it. Right, right. Because the, the profession didn't even dig- dignify you enough to share that with you and to yeah. explain. And to, it's your body, right? Isn't it your body? It's my body. It's like, oh, you had, you had a fibroid. We took it out when we did our cesarean. That literally yeah. was it. Yeah, and that was it. Yeah. Ended there. No, no discussion. I just dropped it. Whoop. And then <laughs> that's it. You're supposed to make sense, make sense of it all. It's like they, they kind of said, oh, we saw white hair when your head, so we pulled it. That's that's how it was said. <laughs> Literally, that's how it was said. Oh, my God, oh. that's an analogy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. thanks for doing that. <laughs> right, right, right. But, uh, you've but been, I hope it's been useful to the listeners at the end of the day. And the, cool. my, my book is called The Hysterectomy Chronicle, and they can get it through my, through my link tree. There's so much to do in a day. Family, friends, and work. The appointments feel endless. The calendar invites keep coming in, and it seems like you never have time to catch your breath. It's easy to hit snooze or push off what doesn't seem urgent to another day. But there are some things that simply cannot wait. So while you're doing it all today, remember that tomorrow has a partner. Mass Mutual. Find out more at MassMutual.com slash Financial Legacies.